Hello. So I want to do a few things today. Where's I post it? Um, I want to talk to you about versioning. I'm in between meetings, so this is going to be a quick raw recording, but I want to share something with you. And it's actually a question that I often get from customers. And that is how do I version my software asset, right? It might be an application. It might be infrastructure as code, um, but how do I do that? And so I want to talk to you about how to decide on the version number. Um, the workflow. So I'll show you actually how I do it on my computer in Git. We'll also then push that uh, into GitHub. And uh, I'll also show you automated change logs. So without further ado, let's get started. The first thing I want to talk to you about is actually versioning. So I have this repo which fires up a demo that I use uh, when talking to customers. Let's look at the change log. This is what I want to do today. Um, I have 030 as the last one, and that was done in June. Um, I've done actually various bits of work, um, and it just I just realized I haven't updated in a while, and I probably should. The first question, then you have to ask yourself, what is the next version and why? So I'm following semantic versioning. I'll post more details in the um, description below. But basically, um, if I have an incompatible change, I should probably increase to 1. The 0 in the first part has to go to 1. If I'm just adding features, the 3 should be a 4. Now I'm going to look at the pull request to see which changes I made, the closed ones. And the one I want to show you is actually a breaking change. So I upgraded the Azure Active Directory provider from Terraform. Now there was a breaking change or incompatible change uh, on the Azure AD side uh, in terms of how passwords are handled for headless service accounts, which we call service principles. Uh, for Azure. Now, it's not breaking in the sense that there's always a time period where both APIs uh, for something as critical as this are accepted, right? But there's messages, warning, warning, this will be deprecated eventually. Um, I ignored it for months, and so I eventually did it about uh, two and a half weeks ago. So if people are using this demo code, if they created their own passwords and they expect to have their own passwords, if they copied it and used it somewhere else, whatever, it would break for them as well. So the question is, do I go from 030 to 040 or 1.0.0? Well, I'm going to teach you to think for yourself because even though this is a breaking change, I'm not going to 1.0.0. So why am I not doing that? Let's go and look at a real life example. So HashiCorp has had Terraform for ages and they actually didn't go general availability or GA until uh, June 2021, so less than a year. And it's like, how? There's always this assumption that, you know, once it's stable, you go 1.0 and you do GA. And they actually do a really good job of describing why they didn't do that. And one of them was that they wanted to be sure it was super robust in production at giant companies like Deutsche Börse, which is the German stock market, Starbucks, etc., before they went that route. So just because somebody said, hey, you know, wrong page, <laughs> somebody said, hey, we have the system and you've bought into that system, it doesn't mean you blindly follow it. You really should think about why you're doing what you're doing and what are your values, right? Your values just um, drive your decisions. And this is what they chose to do. Now, for me, I'm going to go to 0.4.0 and not 1.0, despite the breaking change, because actually to make the demo complete, you'll see that these open tasks from March 2021 are still not done, right? It fires up a skeleton Azure DevOps organization, but really the repos and the permissions for some of them are still missing. Uh, and so for me, it's not really complete that you can click around and show customers like live changes and their effects uh, without those two missing pieces. So I'm, yeah, not going 1.0. So let's bump up the version. I am in my shell with the local copy of this. And actually you can see from my editor, let me make this a little bit bigger. Wow, that changed. Um, I have some stash changes um, and uncommitted changes. Uh, what is this? I'm just actually going to stash this, so I don't know what it is, but I really don't care. And I'm looking back at the history. Um, I actually started uh, working on a feature. Um, this would be issue number 49 in GitHub, and I, I actually haven't finished it. Let's just go back to main. I'm going to check out to main. Sorry for all the different shortcuts. Uh, let me see if uh, I am up to date. I should be. Let me just pull for the hell of it anyway. Okay, that worked without me having to um, uh, to plug this in. So what we want to achieve is not just the tagging, right? The versioning. I also want to auto generate the change log that will go with this. Now I have something called standard version. Um, I've installed it globally. 
So you can, you should be able to do an npm i g and install it globally. I already have it. So, sorry, I am using just the MacBook, not the external display, because this was easier to set up than what am I recording at what resolution. Oh, it's already doing something. That's bad. Uh, let's see. Um, I have my uh, cards in here on a physical device. That made no sense. I have my certificates on that that I need to uh, sign or do any commit works that I do. And you can see that it did it. Um, this is actually a great example. How do I undo the stuff that I just did? Because you see it bumped it a patch. So 0.3.1, which would be a security patch, which is not. So what you can do is, and I'll type this. Um, oh, actually I need to do hard first. Hard head.1, which means, but before I show that, let me show, I added an extra commit and there's also a tag. So I want to delete that commit. This is the easiest way to do that. I also need to delete the tag v.3.1. So let's do this properly. And that is standard version release as minor. So I want to do 0.4.0. Um, this is actually the default behavior, the minor. It means that I did something, uh, I changed it, so I did a security patch. Now, this is now fully automated, and it says all I have to do is actually push. Let's actually look at what it did. So it created the tag for me. If I actually list my tags and their messages, you'll see that there's a message of, hey, 040. Um, this chore release follows semantic versioning, uh, sorry, conventional commits uh, for our automated change log. Now, if we look at our automated change log, let's just go look at it here. Um, you can see that it added um, these features, okay? AAD, AAD provider, some CI CD pipelines. And you can even see that, you know, um, it points to the GitHub issue. Now, if we look at how that happened, right? So I see here GitHub issue 42 is where I am right now. There's a 35 down here. Let's quit this uh, if I type properly. Um, and let's just take the last 10 commits or something. So I'm looking at this now and you'll see that here there's a 49. Here's another 49. The 33 was two weeks ago. And even though my last push was not that long ago, you'll see that I actually did a lot of work and just haven't like committed um, or done a release in ages. So if you remember, it said all I had to do was git push, uh, follow tags, origin, main. And now I should push. Um, I, do, um, I do my git remote calls. Uh, the secrets or the tokens are um, on my shell. I'll explain that in another video. I'm too tired. I'm squeezing this in between meetings just for you. So I pushed it and now there's a new tag. So if we go back to GitHub, then we should be able to see that. And actually, instead of looking at it in um, VI, this is probably easier for you. So I have 040 and a change log. So pretty. Um, what it does is that it will link to the commit for you and it will link to the issue. So, you know, if I wanted to look at like why I need to do this upgrade and that was what I explained in the beginning of the call, I can click into it, right? I just, I love this because I don't have to find anything. Now to get this awesome like uh, view or this like change log, you have to be super disciplined in the types of commits that you make. And this means like sitting down and before you just hit save, if, instead of doing things in the UI maybe, um, the github.com UI, um, just take the extra 30 seconds, one, two minutes to write a commit message that makes sense, right? And take a little bit more time, a few minutes before you push and combine the commits so that really should be combined. So here you'll see a lot of times pipeline, 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 should I combine them all? Yes and no, right? The nice thing about it being small is that they're tied to specific issues. Um, I'll link to this as well, conventional commits. Um, there's various like flavors of it, but the gist is like feet, fix. Why is it feet and not feature? Cause feet uh, with an A, not stinky feet, um, is shorter, right? Than feature. So you wanna like get to the point here in this example, parser quicker. Um, and there's like a general best practice on the lengths of uh, commits. Last thing before I get back to work, uh, workflow. Uh, when do you actually do this? I just did this locally. 
Well, for me, the decision is uh, who is doing this and why, under what context. And so if you follow the conventional commits, it's really nice. You can generate those automated change logs, which just happened beautifully without any changes uh, required by me. But if you look at the very first one, you'll see it was not automated. I did that. Um, I made those changes before I pushed it up to GitHub. Now, um, that's why I would personally never put it actually in my um, CI builds or CD builds. Be like, oh, Julie made a tag and you know, just grab all of that and generate it because it's going to be uh, far from perfect um, most of the time because I don't always follow this super strictly because like I'm making this video in a rush, then sometimes I make commits in a rush. Um, so that's one bit, I do that manually. Now let's talk about what you do once you have that tag. So I have this other um, repository, it's an app. It uses Docker images, which is why you would actually, this tag would have more meaning. The other one's a demo, it was, you know, for me, this one is probably more aligns with some of your use cases who are watching this. So I'm creating a Docker image, so let's go find that. Um, this is in jobs, there's a Docker workflow. Um, and I am, I think I'm doing this manually. So I'm building it and tagging it and then I'm pushing it. But how do I know what's the tag? And what's interesting is that somewhere, I guess not here, not in this uh, template. Um, we'll get back to that then. Uh, how do I know what's the tag? It's calling a variable that's defined somewhere else. So. Um, if there is a tag, uh, I am going to basically lock the production image. So in this repo, I'm think I'm using something like dev for the dev tag, and I'm overriding it. Sometimes I attach a SHA, sometimes I don't. But anyway, um, there's a different pattern. Uh, once I say this is going into production, I actually give it a tag. The other ones are not, right? Um, and so when I do that, I also want to lock it in the container registry. Uh, lock it in the sense that you can't override it, you can't delete it, you can't change it because production stuff should be immutable. It shouldn't be that you can uh, rewrite history. So let's go find where that image tag is set and it's probably set in variables, global. And yes, it's here. And you can see that what's interesting is that it's checking if the tag starts with uh, a V. Now the build source branch, that is a built-in Azure pipeline variable. And you'll see refs tags, refs heads. Um, that's Git, that's not magic by Azure pipelines. You wouldn't see it in uh, GitHub Actions, whatever. That's just plain old Git. Um, it's a single commit, right? That is the tip of a branch, for example, main. Um, it's also a tag. Now what I've done here, I'm guessing, I'm this clever. Um, <laughs> that uh, my pipeline is reacting to a single commit. Now the single commit has multiple contexts of being the tip of a branch as well as um, a tag. Now the reason why I would do that is I don't want the same commit. So the last one here is, I can't see, so I click here, uh, 235BA15. Um, I only want to react to that one time, right? I don't care if it's the edge, uh, the tip of a branch or the branch head uh, or a tag. I only want to react to it one time. If I created a pipeline with a trigger that's a tag for what I'm doing here, it might run the same pipeline twice and I don't want to do that. Um, I only want to react to the push um, event uh, once. So I just set it as a variable. It's just always there. Uh, it makes sense in this case as well because I'm working with container images and there's always going to be a tag, right? So again, for dev, uh, did I set it here? No, I'm just curious. I am probably shouldn't be looking at this now. Yeah, image, if I can type and spell tag. Yeah, so the default is dev. Um, and what I'll do is I'll replace it. Uh, I'll remove this part from the tag. So my v0.3.0 .0 would just be 0.3.0 .0, and that's what I would find in the Azure Container Registry. Okay, that was a quick one. Let me know if this was helpful uh, via the comments below or give it a like, subscribe if you haven't yet. Um, and if you find this useful, please share it with others. Um, again, I get asked this a lot. This was just one example off the top of my head because there was something on my to-do list that I haven't done in a while. Um, if you have any questions about versioning as well, feel free to, um, yeah, leave a comment and I'll get back to you and hope to see you again soon. Bye.